Since no society can continue to exist indefinitely in anarchy, there must be law, a set of rules backed by power, providing a skeletal structure that supports and holds together the many disparate parts of a complex society. Yet the history of human beings individually and of whole nations is painfully full of abuses of power in ways large and small, and sometimes in ways fatal to a whole society when law collapses and gives way to either anarchy or arbitrary tyranny. Legal issues are not just a matter of how one feels about particular individuals or particular policy issues viewed in isolation. What is crucially at stake when courts wrestle with the fate of particular individuals, institutions, or policies is the fate of law itself. It is all too easy to get so involved and invested in the outcomes for individuals, institutions, or policies as to lose sight of how the legal process itself can become compromised or corrupted while preoccupied with reaching particular results. This is all too plain and painful when a prosecutor brings the full weight of the law crashing down on particular individuals with little or no regard for whether there was even a crime committed by anybody in the first place. Two, among all too many examples, are covered in columns in this section about such prosecutions of Lewis Scooter Libby in Washington or three Duke University students in North Carolina. The Duke rape case was covered in a number of my columns over a period of a year, only four of which are reproduced here. This extensive coverage was because that case revealed a moral dry rot that extended far beyond the legal system and included both the media and academia as major contributors to a frenzied lynch mob atmosphere in which anyone who dared to doubt the guilt of the three accused young men was treated as a moral leper. Yet the strange procedures of the prosecutor from the outset gave ample evidence of the fraudulence of the case, as I pointed out in my first column on this case, a year before the multiple layers of fraudulence were exposed by the state attorney general, forcing the resignation of District Attorney Michael Nifong and his subsequent disbarment. This is not just the story of one man's misuse of the law. It is a story of whole institutions and movements that generated a lynch mob atmosphere which threatened the integrity of the law itself, in addition to threatening to ruin the lives of three young men who could not be guilty of a crime that had not been committed. Among the most disturbing emails I received during the year that I wrote about the Duke rape case were emails that asked why I was so concerned about three rich white guys. That attitude is more of a threat to the integrity of the law than even a corrupt prosecutor. Indeed, it is a threat to a whole society, for a society cannot remain a society if it degenerates into a war of each against all. Prosecutorial misconduct is just one of the many threats to the integrity of the law. Judges who treat the law as simply a grant of arbitrary power to themselves to impose their pet notions on individuals, institutions, or a whole society have an even wider scope for lawlessness in the name of law. Here, too, it is the general atmosphere in society at large that allows this corruption of the law to flourish. The Senate has the power to impeach judges and remove them from the bench, but as a matter of political reality, that power cannot be exercised in an atmosphere in which the rule of law is confused with the rule of judges. Those who see court decisions as simply a means to their particular ends, whether on issues like abortion or gun control or innumerable other issues, are treating the integrity of the law as expendable, when law is what holds a society together. Here, too, it is all too easy to start down the slippery slope that leads to the war of each against all. The cry of no justice, no peace is a cry that may find resonance among those who do not see beyond the issue of the moment. But since there are innumerable and conflicting notions of what is or is not justice, it is a cry for the disregard of laws by people in any part of the ideological spectrum which is to say, it is a cry for a war of each against all. Like other erosions and violations of the integrity of law, such a cry is magnified by the support or acquiescence of many people and institutions in the larger society. The more people who see the law as simply a means to their own particular ends, 
the more the whole framework on which we all depend is in danger of being dismantled as part of the general dismantling of America. It is one of the signs of our times that so many in the media are focusing on the life story of Judge Sonia Sotomayor, President Obama's nominee for the Supreme Court of the United States. You might think that this was some kind of popularity contest, instead of a weighty decision about someone whose impact on the fundamental law of the nation will extend for decades after Barack Obama has come and gone. Much is being made of the fact that Sonia Sotomayor had to struggle to rise in the world. But stop and think. If you were going to have open-heart surgery, would you want to be operated on by a surgeon who was chosen because he had to struggle to get where he is, or by the best surgeon you could find, even if he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and had every advantage that money and social position could offer? If it were you who was going to be lying on that operating table with his heart cut open, you wouldn't give a tinker's damn about somebody's struggle or somebody else's privileges. The Supreme Court of the United States is in effect operating on the heart of our nation, the Constitution and the statutes and government policies that all of us must live under. Barack Obama's repeated claim that a Supreme Court justice should have empathy with various groups has raised red flags that we ignore at our peril and at the peril of our children and grandchildren. Empathy for particular groups can be reconciled with equal justice under law, the motto over the entrance to the Supreme Court, only with smooth words, but not in reality. President Obama used those smooth words in introducing Judge Sotomayor, but words do not change realities. Nothing demonstrates the fatal dangers from judicial empathy more than Judge Sotomayor's decision in a 2008 case involving firemen who took an exam for promotion. After the racial mix of those who passed that test turned out to be predominantly white, with only a few blacks and Hispanics, the results were thrown out. When this action by the local civil service authorities was taken to court and eventually reached the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Sotomayor did not give the case even the courtesy of a spelling out of the issues. She backed those who threw out the test results. Apparently, she didn't have empathy with those predominantly white males who had been cheated out of promotions they had earned. Fellow Second Circuit Court Judge Jose Cabranes commented on the short shrift given to the serious issues in this case. It so happens that he too is Hispanic, but apparently he does not decide legal issues on the basis of empathy or lack thereof. This was not an isolated matter for Judge Sotomayor. Speaking at the University of California at Berkeley in 2001, she said that the ethnicity and sex of a judge may and will make a difference in our judging. Moreover, this is not something she lamented. On the contrary, she added, I would hope that a wise Latina woman, with the richness of her experiences, would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life. No doubt the political spin masters will try to spin this to mean something innocent, but the cold fact is that this is a poisonous doctrine for any judge, much less a justice of the Supreme Court. That kind of empathy would for all practical purposes repeal the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which guarantees equal protection of the laws to all Americans. What would the political spin masters say if some white man said that a white male would more often reach a better conclusion than a Hispanic female? For those who believe in the rule of law, Barack Obama used the words rule of law in introducing his nominee. For those who take his words as gospel, even when his own actions are directly the opposite of his words, that may be enough to let him put this dangerous woman on the Supreme Court. Even if her confirmation cannot be stopped, it is important for senators to warn of the dangers, which will only get worse if such nominations sail through the Senate smoothly. The great Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes is not the kind of justice who would have been appointed under President Barack Obama's criterion of empathy for certain groups. Like most people, Justice Holmes had empathy for some and antipathy for others, but his votes on the Supreme Court often went against those for whom he had empathy and for those for whom he had antipathy. As Holmes himself put it, I loathed most of the things in favor of which I decided. 
After voting in favor of Benjamin Gitlow in the 1925 case of Gitlow v. People of New York, Holmes said in a letter to a friend that he had just voted for the right of an ass to drool about proletarian dictatorship. Similarly, in the case of Abrams v. United States, Holmes's dissenting opinion in favor of the appellants characterized the views of those appellants as a creed which I believe to be the creed of ignorance and immaturity. By the same token, Justice Holmes did not let his sympathies with some people determine his votes on the high court. As a young man, Holmes had dropped out of Harvard to go fight in the Civil War because he opposed slavery. In later years, he expressed his dislike of the minstrel shows that were popular at the time because they seemed to belittle the race. When there were outcries against the prosecution of Sacco and Vanzetti in the 1920s, Holmes said in a letter, I cannot but ask myself why this so much greater interest in red than black. A thousandfold worse cases of Negroes come up from time to time, but the world does not worry over them. Yet when two black attorneys appeared before the Supreme Court, Holmes wrote in another letter to a friend that he had to write a decision against a very thorough and really well-expressed argument by two colored men, an argument that even in intonation was better than, I should say, the majority of white discourses that we hear. Holmes understood that a Supreme Court justice was not there to favor some people or even to prescribe what was best for society. He had a very clear sense of what the role of a judge was and wasn't. Justice Holmes saw his job to be to see that the game is played according to the rules, whether I like them or not. That was because the law existed for the citizens, not for lawyers or judges, and the citizens had to know what the rules were in order to obey them. He said, Men should know the rules by which the game is played. Doubt as to the value of some of those rules is no sufficient reason why they should not be followed by the courts. Legislators existed to change the law. After a lunch with Judge Learned Hand, as Holmes was departing in a carriage to return to work, Judge Hand said to him, Do justice, sir, do justice. Holmes had the carriage stopped. That is not my job, he said. My job is to apply the law. Holmes wrote that he did not think it desirable that the judges should undertake to renovate the law. If the law needed changing, that was what the democratic process was for. Indeed, that was what the separation of powers in legislative, executive, and judicial branches by the Constitution of the United States was for. The criterion of constitutionality, he said, is not whether we believe the law to be for the public good. That was for other people to decide. For judges, he said, when we know what the source of the law has said it shall be, our authority is at an end. One of Holmes's judicial opinions ended, I am not at liberty to consider the justice of the act. Some have tried to depict Justice Holmes as someone who saw no need for morality in the law. On the contrary, he said, The law is the witness and external deposit of our moral life. But a society's need to put moral content into its laws did not mean that it was the judge's job to second-guess the moral choices made by others who were authorized to make such choices. Justice Holmes understood the difference between the rule of law and the rule of lawyers and judges. <laughs>